Well, I'd like you to look at the book of Joel, all right, in that clean section of your Bible. <laughs> You'll know where Joel is because it's right after Hosea. After you see the big boys, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea hits number five in the lineup, and then you got Joel, second baseman, All right. the book of Joel. I'm going to give you a little something this morning, something special that's going to be on politics, on the election. Mike Shear said, ah, another Halloween message, huh? <laughs> Kind of. You just stay with me here. Uh, we have some problems in our country. Would you all agree with that? I think we got some problems. They're not necessarily political problems. I'm not talking about the economy, oil prices, jobs, inflation, immigration, Afghanistan, taxes. Those have always been with us. Their political nuances of rule, some more or less moral, but on the by and large, every government deals with those problems. I'm talking about a moral problem. In a drift that started a long time ago, that has been further and further from the foundation that a civilization must be built on, in a drift from what our country has in past days rested upon. One that has uh, given us law and order and human dignity and inalienable rights from nature's God. One that has, as a result, given human dignity and freedom and then peace and justice and the stability of the home, of right and of wrong and good and of evil. And it is a drift from the foundation of God, and not just the G-O-D, nebulous idea, but the God of the Bible, the God who has spoken, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Sinai and of the Ten Commandments, the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Protestants, the God of the, uh, though you may not be, the God of the Catholics, the God of the Quakers, the God of the Puritans, the God of the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists, and uh, the Baptists and the Methodists and all of those guys that have been the, the mosaic of our country. We're not necessarily a melting pot, we're a mosaic. But they have all had that foundation of a belief in the person of the infinite personal God who is Trinity, who gave his son. The God of Western civilization. All of our Western civilization that is built on the idea that the creation and nature is not God. Are you with me? That is a major thought in history, that the creation is not to be worshipped. It is not a pantheistic thing or an idolatrous thing. It is made by God, and it has order. And as we look at its order, we assume that there is an ordered God. He is rational, he's reasonable. And thus we can study it, and we can get science and technology and industry and education and on and on and on. Uh, a God that is the basis of constitutional law, of absolute right and wrong, a God that gives human beings dignity beyond just the animal realm, that they're special with inalienable rights. Well, that is all the foundation of the worldview of a God who is absolute, infinite, holy, and personable and has made himself known. They are all concomitant to Christianity and the biblical view of reality. And historically, departures from this person are not regarded as political problems. They are moral problems that are always dealt, and the problems they have in history is that they are dealt with as political problems which made people violently, vitrolically denunci denouncing those things. That they are not political problems. They are blasphemous and they are not things that can be ruled for or against by a Supreme Court or anybody. They are inherent in the Almighty. And we are judged by not having those things. Like slavery. The big issue prior to 1860 is that it was a political problem. It was an economic problem of textile manufacturing in the South. 
and keeping up with the new invention of the cotton gin and so on and so forth. And the guys in the north like William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and on and on and on that said, no, this is not a commercial problem. It is not an industrial problem. We are talking about humans that you go in and kill everybody, but them put them on a ship, bring them over here and hope they don't die. Then you sell them, then you beat them till they die and you use them and you work them. And that is not a economic problem. Amen. And they had to scream and carry out until ultimately we had a bloodbath over that issue. And some people said, if we can't resolve this, then we can't be a nation. And so slavery was not a, a, a political, commercial problem. Uh, labor conditions in the late 1800s, child labor, women's labor, 16-hour work days, conditions where you couldn't get out if there was a fire, places where you couldn't breathe, uh, having no minimum wage so you could be outbid by some guy that would just use human beasts, even worse. And you made use of the immigrant population and just worked them to death till you got rid of them. And that's when our Supreme Court guys stood up and said, and I quote, uh, you have the freedom of speech, but you don't have the freedom to say fire in a crowded building. You don't have absolute freedom. And no, we have laissez-faire and we have business principles and rights and freedoms to make money, but you ain't got freedom to destroy boys and girls and women and human beings. You can't do that. And so it became a very vitriolic, denunciating thing. Uh, the issue of women's rights and suffrage and equal pay not letting a woman vote because she was a woman. And those Susan B. Anthony's and the like stood up and they said, no, that's not a political issue. You can't rule against that. We're talking about creatures in the image of God, not allowed to participate in a government just because of their gender. You can't show me that in the Bible. And so it was Christians that stood up on these things, as all of these things were Christian. Civil rights in the 20th century. Uh, Martin Luther King said, do not let people register to vote in the South because they're black. That ain't right. And uh, Rosa Parks to say to make me move on this bus and I'm tired and my feet hurt just because I'm black. And that ain't right. And so they quoted scripture. Let righteousness flow down like waters and justice like an ever flowing stream. But this is not right. And you can't pass in government uh, and, and smile at the Jim Crow laws and have black men not ride on trains, not ride on buses, uh, not be able to vote, not to be able to play pro baseball, not to be able to do, you, that M James Meredith can't go to Ole Miss who pays taxes to the state of Mississippi, that you will not let him go to Ole Miss because he's black. And that's not right. And so we had an outcry on that. And now we got the same thing. A little word on this, very moral issues begin as political, industrial, economic issues until like a boil they burst, until people realize, no, civilizations come around slowly, but they come around. Incidentally, this even happened in a non-Christian worldview. You ever heard of Gandhi? And he said, it's not right for British colonialism to do to us what you're doing just because we're Indian. Even your God protests against that. And it's interesting that both Martin Luther King and Gandhi were nonviolent because they said, this is not a question of might is right. And we're not going to meet this with might. We're not going to meet this with any means necessary. We're not going to say a word. We're not going to raise a finger because that would be an insult to what this is. It's an issue of God. And we're not going to force that issue. We're going to do it because it's right. Amen? Yeah, made good sense. It was painful. But it made good sense. In our day, parties in our country, Democratic, Republican, have crystallized, aligned, and they have made as platforms to their campaigns issues of morality, not issues of economics or government or the like. They're not political issues. It has become now to have the embracing of what have always been recognized in our countries as something that was right or something that was evil. 
and we're talking about the murder of infants. We're talking about the elevation of sodomy to the marital status. Our country has never, well, that's not true, but of late days has never ruled against sodomy per se, though there have been sodomy laws. We're talking about the elevation of it to same-sex marriage, altogether different. Or of just the fact of secularism, that somehow church and state is really church or state and God, and he has to be removed from all education. And countries, our country has now polarized and made as a platform abortion, same-sex marriage, and the embracing of secularism on the removing of God and the mention of God from all of our society and legalize that. That's not a political issue. Now you have to vote your conscience. No longer do you get to vote simply as a Republican or a Democrat. You vote your conscience. Now it's hidden in a lot of verbiage. At the Democratic National Convention, uh, our president's wife said, and I quote, and I can always quote national conventions, Mitt Romney simply doesn't want you to love who you want to love. Boo. Mitt Romney does not want a woman to do with her body what she wants to do with her body. Boo. Now, she couldn't say our platform is the murder of infants and sodomy. That's not good political jargon. You're not apt to boo that. So you just simply say through sophistry and illusion, he won't let you love what you want to love or do what you want to do. That's what sophistry is. It's verbal sleight of hand. I heard her say that. And I turned to my wife and I said, if our country does not have the sense to see through that, maybe we're not smart enough to have a president. Maybe we're too stupid to rule ourselves if you can't see that. I'm a phys ed major with a two, three grade point that made a seven on a genetics test. <laughs> and I can see that. Yeah. yeah. I'm that smart to figure that out. It looks like the murder of babies and sodomy. Well, don't get me started. And thus in our country, we have the division and the shaking of our culture because we have left somehow a standard, we have left a memory, and we have left a way of life. And it's scary to go adrift to what historically has held civilization together. A country, and I say this on a, as a flat statement, countries cannot and have not survived on an immoral worldview. They don't work. John Paul Sartre, an atheist, he said, any point is meaningless unless it has an infinite reference point. You can't talk about justice, male, female, rights, or anything unless you have an infinite reference point. It is just semantic mysticism. That's all it is. It's moving you to an emotion that has no ultimate basis. If there is no absolute, then nothing ultimately can be judged. There must be a God. Most important verse in your Bible, it's chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that he's there. Until the 18th century, until the 1700s, we had wars fought over this issue, over the interpretation of what the Bible said. What should be the recognized national church of England, of Scotland, of Ireland, of Germany, of France, of Spain, of Portugal, of uh, Poland, of all of these countries, should it be Catholic and have to respond to a Roman bishop? Should it be Anglican and have to respond to an Anglican bishop, uh, an English bishop, a Canterbury bishop? Should it be Presbyterian, Lutheran, Calvinist, Puritan? Uh, as in Europe, one of these was always embraced by the monarch 
as the national state church. There was no separation of church and state. The church was part of the state. The idea of separation was absurd. The idea that you could have rule without God was absurd. The idea of secularism wasn't invented yet. The only guys that would hold to that were guys way on the extremes. And so always a ruler would embrace and say, this is our state religion. And it was seen that the idea of not having the true God was what made cultures previously fall. It's what made Rome fall. It's what made Greece fall. And it's what, in, in the opinion of those guys in those days, was what was the problem with the Eastern culture, with African and an Indian culture. That they were either idolatrous, they, were, uh, they held to an Allah that was infinite but not personal as being Trinity, or of India that was pantheistic and nature was God. And they felt that those, they didn't call them third world countries at the time but they were just simply barbaric countries and they were felt that they were unhygienic and fallen and non-educable and non-industrial and behind the times because they did not have a God, the true God. Now this stuff, incidentally, ain't coming from me. Uh, this is from guys a whole lot smarter than me, guys that made 12s and 15s on genetic tests. Okay. <laughs> well, that idea and that worldview of uh, church and state, that idea of, church, of God and state being one, it has now been largely abandoned in our country and throughout Europe and in the West. And it is under the auspices of the separation of church and state, which simply mean in, in the, meant in the framers, Separation of church and state meant that a country, that the United States could not embrace Catholicism or Anglicanism or Puritanism. It could not make it the official religion and you had to be that to belong to that, which I say amen. I don't want the state telling me that I've got to be this or that and that the state cannot compel worship. They cannot tax you to pay for their churches. Uh, that's wrong, to which Christ would agree with. And I would say amen. That's what the separation of church and state meant. The idea of the separation of God and reality and government was unheard of. That's what they had to try to find. How can we have God and still not impose him? And the thought was, let's educate people and let them make the rational good choice. And we will have our cake and we will eat it too. We will have people by a free choice choosing to worship uh, whether they want to be Anglican, Catholic, or whatever, that they will still hold to the true God. The idea of atheism was rare, was strange. And so that was what they had in mind. Now our conflict, and incidentally, that's why in Europe they would fight wars. Whenever a monarch would embrace Catholicism, Protestants would go to war. Whenever a monarch would embrace Anglicanism, Catholics would go to war. Whenever the uh, Netherlands, Holland would embrace Calvinism, Spain would go to war. And so I'm not making this up. That was why it was a very dicey thing. Whenever an, a monarch would die and now his son's going to take over and the Catholics would go after him if they were Protestant, surroundings the protestants would go after him if they were catholic surroundings and influence that one guy and if he didn't have a kid it was real scary because now you had to get his cousin from across the sea who had the right to monarchy and you didn't know what he would be and so in europe back in the prior to the 1700s and before it was a scary thing when a monarch would die or a guy would come take over and overthrow because you were about to have war over religion so that's what our country was trying to get away from, was a state church, not the getting away from God. It was assumed that you cannot have constitutional government without nature's God and inalienable rights. Amen? I believe I'm right right there. Well, the conflict now is not between denominations. It is an ideological war, not a denominational war. The stakes have gone up. 
meaning it is the war, not Catholic and Protestant or Catholic and Dutch Reformed. It is, are there moral absolutes and final truth, or is there no moral absolutes and everything is relative? Is there final truth from Scripture and God, or are we existential, and everybody chooses what they want truth to be, and it's true to them? Or is there a creator, or are we naturalistic? Is nature all that there is? Or is man glorious in the image of God, or is he merely a biomechanical machine with no ultimate rights or reason? Or should we be intolerant of certain things, like the murder of infants, like sodomy, because they are absolutely wrong and unnatural and bad and injurious? Or should we be libertine and have no final truth? Or should abortion, same-sex marriage, and secularism, is that a good thing? Or is that a departure? And is that the ultimate death knell of a nation? If there is a God who has spoken, then that is the death knell. If there is no God, then our only alternative is what exists is by accident. It does evolve as truth evolves, as government evolves, and so the rejection of those ancient errors and to evolve onto a libertine system of no final truth, that that is an improvement on what has been and we have moved on, and I quote, from homo sapien to homo noeticus, enlightened men. All right. Okay. And uh, this has become the platform of half of our nation. I'm not saying that there's some guys a hold of this. No, this is in pen and ink. This is the platform of same-sex marriage, secularism, and the destruction of the child in the womb. Well, uh, the prize is the future. We're having a war over an ideology, and the prize is the future. Who's going to win it? The election that we're about to have, it's not the big issue. Do y'all think that if all Republicans get voted in, that somehow the problem is over? Is that what you think? Do you think that if a Democratic president of which this is his platform, sets down. Do you think that there are not 60 million other young men itching for that position that are just as libertine in their views? Do you really think that? That if we can just get these guys in there, that somehow we have dealt with the problem. I saw once a political cartoon by a Christian, and it showed a great fortress with pennants and banners all around, and the pennants and the banners would say, sodomy, abortion, secularism, divorce, pornography, and it showed this ship called the Christian ship, and it's firing and knocking over these little pennants. That's all they're doing. And the castle remains safe and sound because the bottom of the castle says evolution and secularism, that you really haven't dealt with the issue. Now, you're just seeing the little political tip of an ideological Everest that's underneath it. And it is this culture and this worldview that says there is no final knowledge of God. Man determines what is true. Society dictates what is true. Science has become the priest of our country. Did y'all get that? They determine what is true to us. The greatest guys to quote is they. You know what they say? What? That's what they say. That we've evolved. Ah, heck, I hate that. Well, you've got science with its ubiquitous, everywhere evolution. Science with its everywhere worldview of naturalism, that you can't know anything outside the system of nature, cause and effect, trigonometry, algebra, and chemistry. Physics, you can't know anything. That idea that there is not a God and he hasn't spoken. 
naturalism, that all we see is the machine, and that's all that we can know. That's everywhere. It's in Harvard, it's in Yale, it's in Princeton, it's in D.C. Is it in the media? Is it in education? Yeah, the guys that think, the guys that teach, and the guys that broadcast, and the guys that put it on the arts. Is it in Hollywood? He's got the alpha to the omega down here, Satan does. It is in science, education, uh, science, politics, education, media, and arts. It starts with the thinkers, and it goes right down to the housewife with that clicker right there. Everybody. It's in Walt Disney. Oh, yeah. It's in Walt Disney. Every place you want to go, it's there. If this is your first Sunday at Denton Bible, we welcome you. <laughs> Pray you'd have a very honoring and enjoyable time. And it shapes how we see. It, it shapes how we act. It is called postmodernism. That's the word. Modernism is the view that there is final truth and that man left to himself with reason and science and empiricism can find final truth by which to govern himself. It started in the 16th century, 15th century, no, no, no. It started with Rousseau, with uh, Descartes in the 17th century, in the 1600s. That's where it started. Because of the Thirty Years' War, all confidence was lost in Christianity. All these guys can do is kill each other over the Bible. Let's close the Bible, go into ourselves, and find truth. I think, therefore I am. That's where we'll start. And so that was modernism, the quest for truth without the Bible. The religion it came up with was deism, simple, unalterable truths without getting into the heavy stuff. And they thought that would fix things. Uh, and what they came to the conclusion was that you're searching for something that isn't there. Postmodernism says there is no final truth. And all rationalism will take you to, all science and empiricism will take you to, is the fact that something exists and you don't know why. It's just chaotic. That is the post Christian worldview. And folks, that happens to be the generation that you're born in. I'm sorry, but you are. We could have been born at another time, and this is when we were born, is in the last thrashing of Western civilization. It is a body going down in the drink, trying to drag everything down with it, because it has lost its moorings. It's a man cut loose from his tether, and he's been sucked into the cosmos. You know, if you're working on a machine, big, complex machine going pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket. You can work on that machine, but make sure that when you do, you tuck your sleeve in. Because if that machine catches you and sucks you into that machine, it will grind you into pulp. Nature is an incredible machine, but we can look at it and glory in it because we stand outside of it as it's been made in the image of God. We're in the image of God. God made it, and so we can look from the outside with human reason and truth and enlightenment, and we can use this machine, play, praise God for that machine, but if we get rid of God, you catch your sleeve in it, and it will grind you up. You ever heard of Nazism or communism? Well, that's what happened. When you have a machine without God, you come up with an ideology and a politic to govern a godless ideology, and you get communism that is at its base Marxian, Darwinian, and atheistic, or you get Nazism that is at its base Hegelian, Nazi, or Hegelian, uh, atheistic, and Darwinian, and you get the greatest bloodbath in the history of man called the 20th century with communism and with the Khmer Rouge and with Hitler and Stalin and all the other guys, and that is the basis, is that the, the universe is a machine, man is an animal, it's a survival of the fittest. Truth is not static. It is evolving for that generation, and that's how you get that stuff. Now, I I'm not no John Bircher or nothing, but I'm telling you the truth right there. It has been a bloodbath. And so, that is where we are, and that is why we have divorce, porn, an absence of sexual mores, 
youth problems, violence, a lack of decency, filth in the arts, abortion, secularism in education. And you know what this, the election is going to be? It's, it's sandbagging in New Orleans after the levee has broke. Once the levee has broke and the ocean's coming, all you can do is sandbag to try to keep it outside your door. But that flood's coming. And that's where we are in our country. This election is more sandbagging. To which I say, bag away. <laughs> you need to vote and you need to hold it back. But the ocean's coming. Because it's got the education. And it's got the scientific community. And it's got the educators. And it's got Princeton. It's got Harvard. It's got Yale. It's got Cambridge. It's got Oxford. It has Paris. It has Berlin. You name it. It's got it. It's got the actors. It's got the actresses. And there is this remnant throughout the country that by God's grace is illumined to his word and his person and his son. And when righteousness rushes in, the righteous stand as a standard before it. That's all that we got. And so we look for in our church, in our country, a life again called Revive, Revival, and a reforming of going back to the foundations. And we look for a, uh, a regeneration of our country. And it's going to come. And I'm going to show you why. Kendall, I got 10 minutes. Where'd you go? There he is. You're always messing with my mind. See? First service, second service. Okay. He moves to the left after that service this morning. <laughs> it shook him up pretty bad. The book of Joel. Are you with me? I've just given you a 30-minute introduction. It goes real quick. The book of Joel, Israel found itself in this problem. Israel was a nation of God surrounded by pagans, and they were told to stand firm, not to embrace pagan ideas, pagan, pagan gods, or to intermarry with pagan husbands and wives. They were to teach the word of God from parent to child and preserve the truth in this little Eden, this fountain that was called Israel. Are you with me? That's what they were supposed to do. But what they did was they trimmed their sails. And they adopted the pagans' gods, the pagans' morality. They departed from God, and they knew judgment. And it's during that judgment that comes from their compromise, ignorance, and adoption of the pagan ways that God put his curse on that nation. Because righteousness is a, a, an exaltation to a nation. Sin is an, a disgrace, and God judged them. And he raised up the prophets to call them to repentance and the prophets to say to that nation, this is why this has happened. Because you're so smart, you departed from the ancient way. The book of Joel, all right? Jehovah is God. Here is the truth. Well, in this book, in verse 1, all the way through verse 20, you see locust and drought. Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 28 in the giving of the law at Sinai or the repetition of the law that was given at Sinai. God said to them, if you turn to other gods and you give glory to the Baals for your natural harvest and your thanksgivings, God said, I'm going to send the locust to eat it. And what's more, I'm going to turn off the spigot and we'll see how you do then. Well, Israel did and God did. And so in Joel chapter 1, you see verse 4 through 7, there are the locusts. You see in verse 11 uh, through verse 20, you see drought. God says, now you turn to your Baals, your gods of nature, and let's see how you do without me. And things dried up and things were eaten. And what God tells them to do in verse 13 is to put on sackcloth and the leaders of the, the nation, the priests, were to wail. There to verse 14, fast 
and have a solemn assembly and gather the elders and they are to, at the end of verse 14, cry out to the Lord. Because the day of the Lord, meaning his intervention in judgment, it's coming. Sin is a disgrace. The, a, a group of humans that have aborted the very foundational knowledge of the God who is there, God holds that in deep offense. And so he says the locust and the drought, is, it has come on us and you guys need to pray. He said, your problems are bigger than you are. You better get on your face and you'd better call out to the infinite personal God for his mercy. You had better apologize and it had better start at the top and you apologize all the way down. You better be like in the book of Jonah where that Ninevite, that king told everybody, I want you to put on sackcloth. I want the animals to put on sackcloth. Everything in this nation, I want it in apology that maybe God will be merciful and let us live. And then you see in chapter 2, verse 1, you move from the present to the final in the future. And the locusts now morph into an army. You see it down through verse 11. An army is coming. It's Armageddon, the final day, to show you that times don't change. And he looks at this coming army that's going to come around the nation. And you know what God tells him to do? Look at verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me. Your problem is that you have separated yourself from your God. Come back to me. And come with all your heart. In verse 13, don't just render your, you tear your heart, not your garments. Don't go through the motions of Christmas and Easter. I heard a pastor one time at Easter time. He said to the car, everybody showed up and he said, hey, How'd y'all enjoy them Christmas presents? Because I hadn't seen you since Christmas. You're going through your duty. Our author says, don't tear your garments. You tear your heart. You hurt deeply. You be ashamed of what you've done. You weep and you repent. He says in verse 13, return to the Lord your God. I want you to notice this next verse. He is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. Do you all see a cross reference by that verse? It says Exodus 32. Is that right? Or 34? 32? 4? Like I said. You know why that verse is there? It was given at Sinai in 1500 BC. And now we're in the book of Joel that's in like 7th century in there, BC. God goes back to square one. Whenever God said to Moses, Moses said, I want to see your glory. God said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you and I'll declare you the name of God. And God said, this is who I am. And he quoted that verse right there. And so God is saying, let's go back to John 3, 16. You've gotten so sophisticated, so smart. Let's go back to your birthday as a nation when I gave you my word and that separated you from all the nations on the earth, that you had a Bible and nobody else had that. You had a knowledge of who I was and nobody else had that. You bit the hand that fed you. You cut yourself loose from the tether. You plugged the only source of life that you had. You exchanged the fountain of living water for cisterns who are cracked that cannot hold water. Jeremiah. And so God said, you go back to your Bible. And he says in verse 15, you blow the trumpet and you call an assembly, and you gather the people, you get the elders, you get a promise keepers gathering, you get your fathers, you get the men of this nation, amen men, you get the males, and you get those guys, and then you get the children and the nursing infants, then you get mama, and you get that baby. And you bring your children because your life is at stake here. And he says, you let the bridegroom come out of his room, the bride out of her bridal chamber. You interrupt your honeymoon. Wouldn't you think that a guy could get a honeymoon pass? God said, no. You know why no? Because it ain't no use you consummating your union. Because you're about to have a wedding and a children and you're going to bring them into the most God-awful place you've ever seen. 
you better forget having kids. You ever look at your grandkids like I do and say, oh, Jesus, what are they going to go through? It's bad enough where I am. We have departed. And boy, once you depart, you start sliding down. How many of you remember when you were kids? Well, I remember. I'll give you my old man deal. Oh, I'm out of time. Can I give an old man story? Nah, forget my old man story. But it's really good, all right? Where am I? Oh, yeah. And in verse 17, you get the priests, the Lord's ministers, and you get before the altar and the porch, and on the basis of sacrifice, you pray and you cry and you say, God, spare your people. Don't let us get destroyed. And you know what? From verse 18 on, you see about nine marvelous things that God is going to do. So why do I go to the book of Joel? It teaches about five lessons. God can withdraw his blessing to a nation. Would you all agree with that? He can take it back. Secondly, God can bring war on a nation. And he can strike you with an enemy that's worse than you. Any truth to that? He can do it in a heartbeat. He can strike a Jew with a Babylonian. He can strike a, an American with a Muslim. Number three, God can restore things. Number four, God will restore things someday whenever his covenant nation repents. And you know what the fifth thing is? He works through the prayers, the fervent prayers of men and women that look at their kids and say, God, you better do something. You know, when I was at seminary, Dr. John Hen in church history, he once talked about American revivalism. You know what he said? He said, prayer does not bring revival. Prayer is the revival. He said, for God to convert a pagan is nothing. To make a Christian pray, that's an act moving heaven and earth. He said, historically, whenever Christians pray, you always see revival. And you know why they pray? They pray for the same reason. They recognize times are bad. Times are bad. I remember as a kid, we didn't have Christian schools. We didn't need them. Because all the schools, all my teachers were World War II veterans. And uh, if you screwed up, they beat you <laughs> to the glory of God. You think my mother and dad would uh, file suit? No. Then the coach found out I got beaten, and the coach beat me. Then he called home, and he said, Miss Nelson, Lavelle, Tommy got beat today. You think my mama sued him? That belt came off. <laughs> my mother started working me. <laughs> no, we didn't need Christian schools. Something happened, though. And so times are bad. And then secondly, a nation starts asking, why is it bad? Because we departed. And what has to happen in our country is there has to be an enormous enlightenment that people start asking, we got, who do we blame for this thing? And we start looking at evolution and Timothy Leary and the 60s guys and Hollywood and Washington and Wall Street. And we start saying the German liberals that pulled this stunt in the 1800s. And we've got to go back and say, somebody took a hard left. And we've got to go back where we turned and apologize. Because our problem is way deep on how we perceive things. We have, Jesus said, I come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. You won't hold to the Gospel of John, but you'll hold to Schleiermacher You'll hold to Richel. You'll hold to Timothy Leary. You'll hold to John Lennon. You'll hold to Brad Pitt and all the rest. You'll cross yourself with those guys. But a man who rises from the dead, you'll turn him away. Well, and then there has to be the recognition of hopelessness. We're not going to fix this thing in human strength. And then out of fear and desperation, people hit their knees. It's not like you have to call a prayer meeting. They just start showing up. And they start saying, God, you better show up. Back in World War II, they left all the churches open so people could come in at all hours and pray because they were scared. Then you know what happens? You'll start seeing an invigoration of the pulpit and American preachers will quit preaching 
the Bible on seven ways to get a job, 12 ways to have better sex, 16 ways to get buns of steel. <laughs> Americans are the original self-help guys. And we have turned our churches into just great big discos, the Protestants. I always tell young preachers, they say, how do you preach? I say, don't. Teach the word. Frank Sinatra's dead. We don't need another one. Sammy Davis Jr. is dead. We don't need another one. Y'all have any idea what I'm talking about? Yeah. We don't need another one. Preach the word. Teach Romans. Teach Genesis. And let the chips fall where they may. You're going to see an invigoration of preaching. Then you know what you're going to see historically? You're going to see an enormous conversion of millions of junior high kids. That's what you got to have. You've got to have little kids, junior high kids, that just like in the book of Judges, look around at what the mess their parents have made and go, man, the Hebrew word is suckath. You know that? <laughs> this suckath. That's going to be the name of this tape, incidentally. This suckath. They're going to have to say, whatever grandpa did, we have gone a long way from a point of reference. And a bunch of kids have to say, we're going home. And the junior high kids start. The first great awakening started with a revival among high school students. Second great awakening started in Yale whenever Timothy Dwight got the students of Yale and preached on the virtues of the inerrant Bible. And he taught for like six months on biblical inerrancy in their chapels. In the Western expansion, all the young Western guys that were heading off to make their fortunes and where you started seeing the abuse of alcohol so badly you saw the great camp, uh, camp meeting revivals among the young guys uh, on the Hampton Sydney campus. Uh, the the uh, his name was Kerry. Can't remember his last name. It was a the, the the worst kid on the campus repented and became a shouting Methodist. It was the high, it was the college campus. It's the young marrieds. It's the high school kids. The Layman's Prayer Revival, 1858, it was businessmen in New York that all came together and said something has to change. So that's what's got to happen. So you vote your conscience on Tuesday, uh, but you better get on your face in private and as a church. First Thursday, December, we pray again. We normally play in the, uh, pray in the uh, fellowship hall. We probably ought to be having a pray right here. We ought to have about 5,000 guys. Because hell's about to come to breakfast. I'm telling you, it's about to come. Because we're about to push somebody too far. Pray with me here. Father in heaven, as again, we did not ask to be here, but we're here. And many of us were part of the problem, not part of the solution. We got converted. And you opened our eyes to become thy covenant community. Not Republicans, not Democrats, not Kiwanians or Rotarians or Lions or whatever. We became Christians. We became those who were illumined by the Holy Spirit, were converted by the power of God's grace, placed in the body of Christ. And we are in the world, but we are not of it. And we do not hearken to its cry. We do not canonize those from L.A., D.C., Wall Street, Boston, and the like, that our standard, our canon, is the law, the prophets, Christ, the apostles. That's our standard, the word of God. And it has worked well. And it is our highest dream of a God such as you and a Savior such as him and a truth such as the Bible and a salvation such as we enjoy and a future such as coming and a past that began in delight, in Eden, delight. And so, God, we have, uh, we have shot ourselves in the foot. We have exchanged our Rolls Royce for a skateboard and we are suffering. I don't pray, God, that we would smarten up as a nation. I don't pray that we would get intelligent as a nation because man's intelligence is always seen through the, the eyeglasses of his fall. It's always colored how we see. I pray, God, that you would move your church in this country 
to, just like Joel says, that they would see that their families and their way of life is on the line and it's about to be taken over by the darkness. I pray that younger, wiser men would step up. White kids, black kids, Hispanic kids, Asian kids, that they would step up and take their place as Calvins and Luthers and Swingleys and Harriet Tubman's and Sojourner Truths and Martin Luther King's and Frederick Douglass's, that they would take their place in a nation that has wandered and we might go back to the faith of our fathers. Through Christ we ask it. Amen.